From the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com, this is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener podcast coming up on the program. We're going to talk about whether or not buying in bulk is always a good idea or not. Mike Novak with his environmental report, your questions, our answers. And we're going to have Jeff Radke, he's the host of the Law Skills podcast, he's a fellow Wisconsinite. All that and more coming up right now on the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener podcast. Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener podcast is permeating into your ears with your host, Joey Beck. And it could be the weeds. Some gardeners try to get all the weeds out of their garden. Other gardens leave them in their garden. It's really a decision that you need to make. There's benefits to both sides of that. It's just something that you need to figure out what you want to do for your garden. And holly bear. Canning is a science. When you're canning, you want to make sure you follow the directions, follow the recipe, don't cut corners, don't replace things. It's crucial to you, your health, and your family. They're professional gardeners with full-time jobs, and they're on the air now. Welcome to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Podcast, the podcast for the health-conscious organic gardener worldwide. I am Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, gardening partner, best friend, Holly Baird, behind the TWVG microphone here at the WI Garden Media Studios in Southeast Wisconsin. The information you're about to hear is crucial, vital, important to your garden. You just may have to tweak some of the dates and times you applied for for your particular growing area. If you're tuning in for the very first time, well, welcome. We appreciate you tuning in. We hope you find this very entertaining and educational. If you've tuned in for all 29 episodes, we appreciate that as well. And if you don't know who we are and you stumbled upon our podcast just by happenstance, Holly will tell tell you a little bit about who we are, what we do, and then we'll discuss should you really buy in bulk. So we have um, on our website, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com, we have over seven hundred and thirty how to videos, gardening, homesteading, canning, reusing items, repurpose items, all that good stuff. We also have our quarterly digital magazine. This magazine comes out four times a year, and it is full color. You can download it. Or you can print it out, or you can put it on your iPad or electronic reading de- reading device, and that is available on the website as well at the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden. How much does that cost? It's free. It's free, and then we have even a tomato special one as well. Um, and then we also have uh, questions and answers. We have some great uh, links, and we have the videos and then this podcast as well. As speaking opportunities, you have a garden center, garden group, garden club that you want us to talk at too, and you're outside the uh, Wisconsin area. We can still do that. Click on that speaking request tab at the top of the page at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com, and watch the video. And, and we can speak locally too. And we can speak locally too, and watch that video and see how we can do that virtual, the wonderful world of technology. Right. So now that that's uh, a little bit about who we are, now let's uh, talk about uh, one of the big things that a lot of people see on the TV or or if they go to the store. Let's just talk about the the general. Or just in general. In general, the the general consensus. You may have, um, you know, a space for it or... Uh, well, well, let's let's kind of take this in two different uh, two different chunks here. One, you can buy in. Uh, should you buy in bulk? And two, you've got the coupon hoarders. Mm-hmm. We're not talking about the people that buy seventeen bottles of shampoo because they can save a nickel if they buy more than twelve or whatever the case is. Mm-hmm. We're not talking about prepping. We're not talking about having enough food set up for a oh my well, goodness I don't event. Think the couponers. Who have 46 rolls of deodorant and 36 bottles of mustard are prepping. I think they just get it because they get a good deal. Do you ever, in a lifetime, would you go through 47 bottles of, of mustard? I'm not really sure. Okay. But it, we're, we're not talking in that general sense that you see on, on the TV, the, the couponers. We're not talking about the, the preppers where they have basements or cellars or buried uh, areas of guns and food that will sustain life for five or six years in the case of the whole world disappears except for that little nook of the world. We're talking in general. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah, so this would be like, say you have a friend that's like, okay, well, I buy this, this, and this in bulk, and, oh, it's such a good deal, and blah, blah, blah. Or I buy everything from Costco or Sam's Club or one of those um, large warehouse stores. If I buy the 55-gallon drum of green beans, I can save a buck ninety per pound versus buying cans. Well... 
they that type have, of mines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they don't have 55. They have individual cans of that, green that beans. That would be a lot of green beans. Yeah. 55 have, gallon but drum. They make it so it's more accessible. It's not but like, then you can use the drum for other things if you had it with a plastic drum. Right. No, they you make can turn it into it's a not rain like barrel. restaurant. Yeah. It's okay. like they make the cans individual. You've seen the tuna. Yeah, I've seen the cans. I bring yeah. home tuna. Do yeah. I bring home a gallon of tuna? No. Yeah, that'd be I a bring big home. Anyway. <laughs> Anyway, so... Instead of going to the store and buying a four-pack of tuna at your conventional grocery store, or two-pack, I guess it would mm-hmm. it be, you're going to the big bo- the, the, the warehouse stores, and you're buying in bulk 20, or th- what was it, 20, t- 15? I or think it was like 16. 16 cans of tuna for, for pretty close to the same price as you were buying four right. or two at the local or grocery cheaper. store. Or cheaper. Yeah, same thing with... It depends, so... I've I've done some math and sometimes it is cheaper, and sometimes it's not. So, for example, I did. You got to be good at math at this, right? And you have to you have to want to do this to figure it out. Just Otherwise, because it looks more doesn't mean in the long run you're saving money, and or you're going to go through it before it expires too. That's also something we need to keep right. in mind. But then there's also things like toilet paper, and I did the math. I did the math at, for. You know, I have certain places that I will shop and only shop because it's within my radius and it's within um, a, reasonable a reasonable time, time that it would take. Yeah. yeah. Um, like, for example, we don't really shop at Walmart because the closest one is about a half an hour away. And there is one a little bit closer, but it's not a super Walmart. So it's and Target and Costco are, are closer and they're right by where I work and where we live. So I so I do a lot of comparison shopping between those two. And the benefit to Target, we can just give that little secret. The reason why you choose to shop at Target is because you have a, a, a 5% off with the, what is it, a credit card, debit card? It's a debit card. I was going to mention that. Okay, okay. Okay, I'm getting there. All right. Okay, so I did some comparison shopping because we have the Costco membership. And then we have 5% off at, uh, my de- if I use my Target debit card, I get 5% off everything. I'm sure there's some exclusions, but pretty much everything. Then in, this includes like toilet paper and food and what whatnot. So I did the math and I went to Costco and I figured out how much it was down to per sheet, like one sheet of toilet paper, one sheet of. Can you can you spare a, what is it what is it can you <laughs> a square a square yeah yeah, yeah. so can I figured you spare this a square out, right yeah for a per sheet to toilet paper and paper towel. Okay, and, it, and this was just like, like Costco has their Kirkland brand, Target has their Up and Up brand. So I compared those two, and then I also compared per sheet plus, okay, so like say that the, the it's like 32 cents a roll, I have no idea. And then at Target it was cheaper with our 5% off. Plus, if you use the, the other app, they have a coupon app, you get an additional 5% off on top of that. I did not include that 5% off because they don't always have that deal. But they do a lot, so I do the math, and this, and yeah, it took some time, but it, sometimes it's worth it. You don't know. It was it a huge difference? No. If I was at Costco and really needed toilet paper, and I didn't feel like going to Target, then I would be buying it there. But I don't let our toilet paper get down to that point. You can't afford letting it get down that low. No, it's dangerous. <laughs> it's dangerous. But but when you when you talk about a minute amount, we're we're not talking five or ten dollars difference. But over a period, but I think it was like a, at least a couple dollars. But over a let's let's pick a number five year span, mm-hmm. you're going to save a considerable amount by spending that extra fifteen minutes doing the math across the board. Right. Over a five year span, you're saving a good chunk of money that can be spent on other things besides toiletries. Right, and then even like um, ribs, we got some ribs that one time. We got three slabs of ribs to smoke on the grill. And that was cheaper than the one grocery store we go to, so you do have to look at it like that. And, and when the gro- one grocery store was it two ribs or one rib? One. One rib for fifteen. Fifteen. And then we got three slabs for thirty. So we got basically one free slab it's like of rib. Buy two get one free. Right, right. So you got to look at that as well. Yeah. So you have to kind of you be aware, and like we also have the organic food store I shop at. They have a bulk section where I can get uh, lentils or legumes or. If we want to have rice or, you know, dried goods, oats, whatnot. And a lot of times you have to look at that, too, you know. Which is good because if you're minimal on space, you may not want to buy a five-pound bag of rice. Right. If you need two cups, you can get two and a half cups and, and, and get what you need. I've done that. I've gone there, and I we don't eat a lot of rice, but I wanted this wild rice for 
the soup I was making, and instead of having a bag of wild rice hanging around, for, I just for got, three or four years after for, you <laughs> used one cup of it, right? I just they have measuring cups there, so I measured what I needed, put it in my bag, and went on my merry way. And I think it cost me like thirty six cents or something, which may not be the most cost effective way, but you're not housing products that you only use on a rare occasion, right? right. And that's another thing is I was able to use it just for that soup. And it's not sitting in my Getting cupboard. pushed around in a cabinet somewhere. With doing whatever. So, yeah. So, you have to look at that as well. And, uh, you know, if you have a deep freeze, that's another thing. You know, if you have... We keep... a, a deep freeze is an investment that is worth... That, that'll pay itself off. Right. So, we'll keep meat and then we'll keep sometimes like, you know, we come home after a long day. We want to do a, a frozen pizza or something like that. Um, either rather of us feel like cooking. It doesn't happen a lot. But... We just don't eat vegetables. Yeah. <laughs> But, um, so we have that as well, and I usually try to look for deals and stuff like that, you know, two for one or, or whatnot, so that we do have um, a little bit of stuff in there, and then we, we, you know, we keep our green, our frozen green beans and frozen fruit in there as well. Which, so, which, which does two things. One, it opens up the regular freezer above the refrigerator for other items, and two, it prevents dangerous things occurring when you open up that refrigerator, that freezer, that things don't shoot out at you because you packed it so full because you don't have additional freezer space somewhere else. Right. Or have to get really good at packing a freezer. Right. So, yeah. So, you have to just kind of take your time if you have the time, especially when it comes to things like toilet paper. I know you see that big thing at Costco and you're like, oh, this has got to be the best deal. It might not be the best deal. And it, but if you're like, hey, I'm here. I need toilet paper. I, you know, then, and if you're like desperate for it, then I say go for it. But, um, I would definitely do a little thinking, shopping, and do what's available to you. Um, I am in no way one of these couponers where I'm like, yes, I spent 36 cents and got $100 worth of free toothpaste, but I do like to save money. I got, I got a good deal today on a per, some personal items that I use, and I was really excited about it. Plus, I got 5% off of, on it. And, plus other 5% off. So 10% off plus it was like buy two, get one free. And it's something I'm going to use and I have the space for it. So I, I was excited. Real, real quickly on the, on the let's, let's talk the toilet paper, paper towels. You're saving money because you did the math, but also is with, with specifically that type of, of material or, or product, cheaper is not always better. No. You get what you pay for. Right. But I do like to target toilet paper. Right. We like it. Right, but the cheap stuff is cheap for a reason. But, yeah, but if you... I mean, this is two-ply. It's nice. It feels cushiony on your on your bottom. But um, <laughs> there is a one-ply that you can buy that's like... Um, a rest, pu- pub- public restroom material. Yeah, like yeah. wayside yeah. on the... Uh, school, school type of... Right. Yeah, yeah. No, this is two-ply. This is a Target brand. It's probably comparable to like... One of the name brands. One of the name brands. And I also discovered that Bounty makes a generic called Bounty Basic, and their, um, I've never tried their toilet paper because the Target brand has always been what I've bought, and it's been the cheapest, but their paper towels are quite absorbent. You can do like the half sheet as well as the full sheet, and they are a good deal as well. So keep that in mind. And well, you know, with paper towels, that's one of the most, I guess, used items. You could use rags or whatever, but some things you want to wipe up and make disappear. Right. We don't uh, use a lot of paper towels. Right. Uh, I mean, if you have a grease spill, you don't want to wrap, wipe it up in a, in a rag, no, m- not necessarily, and then hold on to it for a couple of days until you do the wash and, and that type of thing. Right. So, you know, that type of thing. So when it comes to buying in bulk, is it more affordable? Yes, if you do your math. And no, not on every item. And sometimes if you need just a teeny bit of something... It might be good to go to the bulk section with the dry goods and get what you need and go on your merry way. After the break, Mike Novak with his environmental report will be with us, as well as your questions and our answers right after this. No gardener wants to walk through a garden with dull, droopy flowers. You want your flowers to be big, bright, and beautiful. With age-old bloom, you can have flowers that will achieve this. Bloom supplies flowers with a high level of phosphorus and encourages flowers to bloom big, bright, and beautiful. Visit ageold.com for more information on age-old products, bloom, 
and our suppliers. Do you want your next raised beds to be easy, functional, and beautiful? The Embrace helps you create the garden you've always wanted. Finally, raised beds that everyone can assemble and enjoy. No tools needed. Just slide any lumber into the Embrace corner, fill with your favorite soil mix, and you're ready to plant. Made from 100% recycled steel right here in the USA. And a portion of every sale helps to build school and community gardens all across the country. Let the Embrace help you create your next raised bed. Grow beautifully with the Embrace. Available at local garden centers and online at artofthegarden.net. Looking for a fast-acting, non-toxic weed killer for your organic garden? One that works in cool and cloudy conditions as low as 40 degrees and is highly biodegradable with visible results in less than two hours? Then look no more. Avenger Weed Killer has it all and more. Made from oranges, Avenger is highly effective, easy to use, and has a pleasant citrus aroma. It is armory listed and approved for organic gardeners under the USDA's National Organic Program. Avenger Weed Killer is a choice for organic gardeners and homeowners who are looking for an effective, safe way to control unwanted weeds. Weeds. Available in ready-to-use sprays and concentrate. Ask your local lawn and garden supplier for Avenger Weed Killer. For more information and a list of suppliers, visit AvengerOrganics.com. Avenger Weed Killer, eco-friendly, deadly to weeds. Now back to two gardeners that make no claims that they know a thing about golfing. We don't golf, so we're not going to listen to podcasts about golf or watch television shows on how to golf. But they're pretty good at gardening. Joey and Holly Bear. Welcome back to the program. If you want to check out our sponsors, you can visit them on the podcast tab under the podcast tab at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com. Feel free to support them as they support us. Those links are also in the show notes below. Well, each program, our good friend Mike Novak from Q4 Radio out of Chicago, Illinois, is, joins us. With his take on the environment. We call it the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Environmental Report. Mike's not afraid to tell you what he thinks that you need to do to make things better for the world. And here is Mike Novak. And now to a man who's not afraid to tell you what you need to do to keep the planet he lives on clean. Take your food scraps out to your compost pile. Screw in a compact fluorescent light bulb. Turn on a window fan instead of an air conditioner. Low flow, baby. Shower heads and toilets. Take one napkin at Starbucks instead of six. Mike Novak. Welcome to another installment of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Environmental Report. I'm Mike Novak. And you can hear me live each Sunday morning from 9 to 11 a.m. Central Time on Q4 Radio, which streams at QUENumeral4.org and on the Q4 Radio Facebook page. You can also get my podcasts at MikeNovak.net, M-I-K-E-N-O-W-A-K. On one of my recent shows, I had a fascinating conversation with entomologist Doug Tarrant, who is curator of biology at the Peggy Notabart Nature Museum in Chicago. He has been called the butterfly guy, though his knowledge takes him far beyond the insect order Lepidoptera. So, I had to ask him a question about the fate of the monarch butterfly. Since I discuss it on the environmental report occasionally... Specifically, the monarchs in eastern North America, which migrate each year to the Sierra Madre Mountains of Mexico, where they overwinter before returning to summer breeding as far north and east as Nova Scotia, Canada. Here's part of the conversation. One of the questions that came up on my Facebook page when I posted that you were going to be on the show is uh, from a friend of mine who actually lives in California. And she said, well, I understand the monarch and you know, people want the monarch uh, to live, but why? What, what's the point? Of, I mean, that's, that's, even, that's harsh <laughs> to say it that way. But what is it that makes the monarch so special? And I started thinking about it and I realized it's an iconic butterfly. Okay. So this is a butterfly that's maybe the best known butterfly in the world. But it feeds on a plant that is poisonous to a lot of critters. I mean, it, it's one of the few uh, uh, animals that can, can feed on milkweed. Um, 
it itself is poisonous to a lot of critters, so it's not a huge food supply. From what I understand, it's not a great pollinator. So why are we trying to protect this butterfly? I mean, what does it bring to the table? That's a, it's a question that, that comes up a lot, not just in, in terms of the monarch, but with a lot of these conservation projects, particularly those involving insects, where uh, there seems to be less of an innate appreciation for insects than there is for something like a bald eagle or a panda. Which are considered megafauna, mm -hmm. but personally, I consider the monarch butterfly a megafauna. Well, in the insect world, the monarch is a megafauna. I mean, by insect standards, it's enormous. Um, so the, the fact of the matter is, if the monarch were to disappear from the planet tomorrow, aside from a lot of people being very sad about that, <laughs> um, not much would probably change if that were the only change that happened. Really? Yeah. Okay, um, so it's not – I love this analogy, and you've heard it before uh, about you flying across – uh, the country in an airplane, you remove one rivet at a time, and what's the point at which the airplane falls out of the sky? Mm -hmm. If we took the the monarch rivet out of the airplane, it's probably not going to fall out of the sky. Or, we, or uh, do we not know the answer to that? We never fully know the answer to that, but to the extent that we understand the role that the monarch is playing from an ecological standpoint at the moment, the airplane is probably not going to fall out of the sky. Uh, it's certainly not something that would be considered a cornerstone species that uh, the ecology of a lot of other species is dependent on the role that it plays in its ecosystem. Uh, I think it gets a lot of the attention that it does because it is beautiful and it is fascinating. You know, it's got such a complicated uh, life cycle. The migration is... Well, that makes it iconic mm -hmm. alone Absolutely. in that it migrates. It's... From what I understand, the only butterfly that does that. Is that correct? It's the only butterfly that migrates on a regular recurring basis okay. that way. Okay. Yeah. So there we are. So we're trying to save this butterfly almost for us, for our culture and our history of it and what it brings to human beings. I mean, and that's... Yeah, the cultural connection around it. Right. And, and if you read Michael Pollan... That's that's a reason why animals continue to survive because uh, – and not, at only, not just animals but plants. It's because they make themselves useful to human beings mm -hmm. or iconic as in the case of a monarch butterfly. Um, maybe that's it. Maybe that's why we save the butterfly is for us. Well, that, that may well be. Um, you know, I, I'm of a mind that – I never want to see any species go extinct. You know, I, I'm, I'm one of these people who will get really sad if I hear about an obscure little springtail that lives in a mountain meadow in Wyoming going extinct, something like that. But um, clearly the monarch gets the attention it does because it is a big, beautiful animal with a fascinating story. It certainly is. And it would be a tragedy if we let it go functionally extinct under our watch. That's my report for today. I hope you catch the Mike Novak Show on Q4 Radio, QUE numeral 4.org, which you can always link to at my website, MikeNovak.net. Go green or go home. Thank you, Mike Novak. We always appreciate you coming on the program and enlightening us with uh, topics and content that quite possibly we should have already known before you even told us about it. Right. So when it comes, now it's that time where it's question and answer. Your questions, we get give you our answers, and if you don't like our answers, you should reconsider asking the question. We've got three questions today. One's about coffee grounds, one's about storing potatoes, and one's about why is my tomatoes getting eaten and what's going on with that. So first we'll, we'll talk about coffee grounds. The question is, uh, I'm a new gardener. And I know that I can use coffee grounds in my garden, but how much is too much to put in my garden? Very good question. Well, it really depends on the type of soil that you're adding coffee grounds to. Now, coffee grounds can be also added to a compost pile as a nitrogen supplement, as a green material. Mm -hmm. It'll help heat the pile up. Coffee grounds, where can we get coffee grounds first of all? We should not buy, we should not pay for coffee grounds. Uh, people seem to think that there's some kind of, how do we get our coffee grounds? Well, 
we go to we first I don't I don't go there first I call first I call and say if I bring you a five gallon bucket um, can you give me some coffee grounds and they say yeah and we need a lid or we don't need a lid or we need your no- number we don't need your number what, whatever their deal yeah. is and then drop it off pick it up usually it takes about a day or two it just kind of depends and then I and then we have coffee grounds and it's free and it's a local coffee shop um, you can call any coffee shop in your area and they should have them if they give you hassle about it, hang up, call a different one. Right, pretty much. Uh, we've never had a problem with them. They've been more than happy, willing, and thankful when we pick up the, the, the used coffee grounds. There was that weird one where they ended up putting garbage in our five-gallon bucket, and I said, just give me the bucket back, and I went somewhere else. Yeah, we don't go back to that one anymore. <laughs> no. Now, some people will, and we'll get to the how much, some people will feel the need to buy something from that coffee store. We don't do that. We simply, because what is happening, they, some of these people understand that that stuff just going to the landfill. Right. And, and, this can, and people's ask, what do we use them for? Yeah, and actually I've had, I've had the manager give me my bucket and then give me a garbage bag of additional coffee grounds and say, I was just going to toss these, but you can take them. And so they're appreciative. They, they like that we take the, the grounds. So how much is too much to add to your garden? Again, it really depends on the type of soil you've got. If you've got good, organic, rich compost soil and a raised bed, uh, probably once a year, maybe a quart per square foot, work it in, be probably good enough because you've got good soil there. After a couple of years, you might want to up that a little bit. If you're in a native, regular backyard garden, you've dug the soil up, uh, I would recommend every bit of one gallon per square foot. Mm -hmm. Uh, Five gallon bucket full for 10 square feet. Because, and that's every six months, because number one, coffee grounds have a 2% nitrogen amount. You know, fertilizer has the three numbers on the front of the bag. Mm -hmm. Nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and potassium. Uh, Coffee grounds is a 2%, uh, about 0.2, and about a 0.2 on on the other two. So you're adding some nitrogen into the soil, but also you're you're going to be welcoming or inter- introducing or um, uh, enticing worms to come in right. and feed off this. Mm-hmm. Worms love coffee grounds. Now, just don't pour it on the ground. You're going to have to work this in in the first couple of inches of soil, if not spade it in. We're, and we're, we're very adamant about minimal soil disturbance. But there are times where you have to loosen the soil up. We did that this year and have seen phenomenal results because of that, because time was taken to loosen the soil up eight inches down with a garden fork. Not a tiller. Saved a lot of worms by using a garden for it. So on a native, regular bed of soil, uh, five gallons for 10 square feet, half, uh, <clears throat> yeah, about a half gallon of coffee grounds, a uh, half gallon to a gallon of coffee grounds per square foot is kind of what it comes down to. And about every six months, that would probably be recommended right. for them. Next question, what is the best way to store potatoes? Well, it depends on what you have space for and where you live and all that good stuff. And how many potatoes you have. Right. So if you have a lot of potatoes and you like, you know, your fresh baked potato, then you want to choose an area that's dark. You want it to be between about 38 and 42 degrees. That would be ideal if it's a little bit warmer. Obviously, they're not going to last as long. And you want about a 90, was it 95%? 95% humidity. Humidity. But, But we all don't have the ideal conditions. No. But, the, okay, so those are the ideal conditions, and those will allow your potatoes to store probably about nine months, I'd say. What do you think? Oh, well, it's, yeah, it's, it's every bit of six. Right. Between six and nine, things are going to get a little, going a little go, will be going downhill slightly. Right. So that's kind of the ideal potato storage picture. Okay. So with with that, potatoes, the goal is not to see how long we can store them. The goal is to store them long enough to where right. you have them through the winter and then you you transition to another plant until the harvest is ready in the following year. Right. So okay. So to keep that in mind, that that's ideal. So you can, and also you don't want them to be in direct sunlight, which is not you don't want to be in direct sunlight either. So that's ideal. Some people will store them in their refrigerator, like in the bottom of the refrigerator. That's fine if you have room for that. If you have like a root cellar type situation, 
uh, maybe have a spare room in your house that you keep cool. A, uh, right, a cool, a cool dark room. Put them in a box underneath the bed or in the back of a cabinet. Right. Make sure it's cool though, because during the winter, I know. Don't have the cabinet besides beside the stove or or an exhaust fan. Right. Because you're going to warm them up. They're going to sprout. They're going to get very leggy. Or, or they have heat. Lo- yeah, heat. Right. Right. Okay, so you can store them like that, just dry storage. Now you want when you dig up your potatoes, you don't want to clean them. If you leave the dirt on, it helps. Sealing the goodness. It, 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 for, it slows spoilage down because there's still a barrier. Right. And the skins are extremely tender at the time of harvest. Mm-hmm. So you're wanting that, to leave that dirt on, try to get those potatoes to cure some prior to putting them in long-term storage. Right. Okay, so there's the dry storage. We'll call it that. Then there's canning. You can can potatoes. You do need a pressure canner. and you do, do not water bath it. You will get sick. It doesn't work. It's not recommended. It is the wrong way of preserving them. Right. So you're going to peel your potatoes. You can then chop them to your desired size. Does any potatoes work for that? Or is there certain potatoes that are better? Any works. Uh, to can, but you have to leave them cubed. You can't decide to make mashed potatoes, put them no. in a jar. You have to leave them cubed. Right. Then after the procedure... Six, mu- six months down the road, you can open them up and then mash them, right. warm them. Okay, continue on. So you store them in water. I think, if I remember right, you put a little salt in the the jar as well, and your potatoes, and then then you have your canned potatoes. They're pretty good. They are. I liked them. I liked them. Because it was instant. Open it up, warm them, you're done. You don't yeah. have to wait to cook the potato again. Right. It's totally worth it, I think. So we got the canned potatoes. We got the dry storage. The freezing potatoes, we haven't done this yet. But you can do this. What you do is first, you take your potatoes. You can uh, blanch them in salted. You cook them in salted water, and then you blanch them. And this process allows them to get cooked enough where they're okay for freezing. But you still have to cook them once they come out of the freezer. And then you can shred them, chop them. Uh, I'm sure you could freeze them whole as well, and then then they're ready to go. So there you go. A couple ways to store your harvest of potatoes. Whether you have harvested them already or you're about to. Right. Our final question comes to us from a very disgruntled uh, tomato grower. Something's been eating my tomatoes. They look like little bites have been taken out of them. Not all the plants are affected, but mostly the beef steak or the large tomatoes. What is going on? Is this a raccoon? Is this a squirrel? No, it's not a bird either. It's most likely the tomato hornworm, especially if you see little teeny tiny black droppings around where it's being eaten. Typically, they will go after the larger tomatoes, the beefsteak, the the, the sandwich tomatoes. And uh, most likely about one day prior to you harvesting them, right as the peak color appears on it, because it becomes more tender for the the hornworm to uh, ingest it, to eat it, to gnaw on it. Right. Okay. So yeah, that's and and the cherry tomatoes are not going to bite into or affect as as frequently because they cannot physically set on it. Yeah. Now, now, if there's a lot of cherry tomatoes in a row, that's they might go after it because they can kind of nest on one and eat another one. But typically, it's the larger tomatoes that you're you're having the effect on. Okay. So let, let's talk about how we can try to prevent this and or some pre measure pre precautionary measures that we can do to ensure some at least some tomatoes for us. Sure. So I'll talk about what we can do to prevent this, and you can talk about the precautionary. Okay. So to prevent this, or to to help yourself after you've had the tomato hornworm, is one, if you can find them. Um, if you can find the tomato hornworm, then you just pull them off and destroy them. If you can't, then if you have chickens, maybe you can get your chickens to find them. They will peck the red tomatoes, too. So right. you gotta, you got to watch them. You just can't let them go. Right. Um, or if you have small children, maybe they might have... A better time finding them. They do. They they blend in with the tomato plants. So that's one thing you can do is try to find the hornworms, remove them from the plants. They're most active during dusk and dawn. Right. Okay. So then that's one. The other thing would be to spray what's called BT. It does have a really long scientific name, but if you if you go to your local garden center and ask for BT, they'll know what it is. Or if you Google BT for tomato plants. Again, you'll find it. And what this does is you spray this all over your plants. It's an organic. It's organic. Yeah, it's organic. You spray the leaves. And what this does is as the tomato hornworm eats it, it basically causes their insides to explode. And so it's not good for them. But it's it's okay because they're eating your tomatoes. So there's another option. Some people will say you can hose your tomato plants down, 
obviously you risk breaking limbs and and whatnot. But if your tomato plant is seen better days and the hornworm has you know destroyed it, it might not hurt. Um, and then finally, am I missing here? Oh, uh, the you could take a tuna can, nail it to the end of a post so that it's just sitting there. Put bird seed or peanuts or something in it. And then what will happen is the birds will come and eat the bird seed, and then they're going to see the hornworms, and they're going to like, mm, look at that big, fat, juicy worm, and pull it off the plant and, and have a good dinner. One thing to add about the uh, BT, it comes in liquid as well as powdered form, and it does need to be reapplied after rain. Now, one last thing, if you have a tomato hornworm and you see it, and it's sitting there like just chilling on the branch, and it has these little tiny white things, like super teeny tiny white cocoon things on its back that hornworm is dead that's the uh larvae of the brackened wasp that wasp is fine um it's not gonna harm you it's a good bug it's a good bug so that's basically like an ecosystem working together the wasp is killing sucking the life out of the hornworm and then it's going to develop into a wasp which is a good bug to have around your your home so now after you've experienced the hornworm at the end of the season, you don't. Well, next year you don't want to plant tomatoes in the same spot as you did this year, and in the bed that the tomatoes are currently at, you want to go in there and disturb the soil. Now you can choose your method, whether it's shovel, fork, or tiller. And at the, at the end of the season, what has happened is the larva turns into a moth. The moth, the moth, which is a it's a pretty pretty little bug. It will lay its larva in the soil. By disturbing the soil, you disrupt the level that that larva was laid in. And over the winter, it will either become too warm or too cold based on the depth that you have disturbed it as. And it has a 90% chance of dying and not coming back next year. So that's another way of going about it. One One way, if you're experiencing hornworms, and we are currently in the large garden is as you see the pigment change in the tomato, tomatoes ripen from the bottom up. The shoulders, the top of the tomato is one of the last portions of it that changes color or ripens. What you can do is as you see the color begin to change on the tomato, you can harvest that tomato about two, three days earlier than you would if you waited until it was completely ripe. If you wait until it's completely ripe and you get and you do have hornworms, the chances of you getting it before the hornworm is very slim. Right. So by harvesting two or three days early, you're not going to affect the taste, the, the texture, the sweetness. It will ripen on the windowsill just fine by harvesting it a few days earlier. That way you can have the tomatoes and your hornworms cannot. We appreciate the questions. If you do have a question, you can feel free to send it to us via our website at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com. On the right hand side, you'll see a big red button that says "Question." If you're on a mobile device, you may have to push that button that shows more stuff. What the a, menu button? The menu button. That's what they call that. And you can submit it there. You can also go to social media. Find us on our Facebook page, The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. You can submit that question there as well. Either way, or other social medias are available, we will answer it privately as well as we will address it on the show. We'll leave your name out of it uh, for your respect. So others around the world can be helped by the problems that you're facing in your particular growing area. Coming up after the break, our good friend, fellow podcaster, Wisconsinite, Jeff Ranke from the Lost Skills Podcast will be with us right after this. It's all about the soil at ManureTea.com. With their grass-fed, antibiotic, and growth hormone-free cattle and horses, owner Annie Haven puts the quality in her premium soil conditioner. 100% organic and natural, whether feeding your flowers or veggies, indoors or outs, you can grow organically with confidence. To purchase authentic Haven brand manure tea, small orders or large, go to manuretea.com. Always free shipping. If you could double the life of your raised bed boxes by sealing the wood with a non-toxic wood preservative, would you? Well, now you can with a clear, penetrating product called Internal Wood Stabilizer. It's 100% non-toxic and easy to apply. Seal your bare, untreated wood surfaces, even chicken coops, by spraying Internal Wood Stabilizer. It's invisible, seals the wood from the inside out, and never wears off. Recommended by organic gardening experts. Internal Wood Stabilizer. Check it out at TimberProCoatings.com. 
A gardener knows that the key to a good plant is its roots. With poor roots, the end result is not good. Conventional pots and trays cause roots to wrap around and become root-bound. Then you try to unwrap the roots at the time of planting, hoping not to break them. But never again with the Root Maker, a non-chemical innovation that naturally air prunes roots to create more vigorous roots. Never a root-bound plant again. Whether trees, flowers, or edibles, home gardener or commercial grower, more roots means healthier, more productive plants. To get your own, visit RootMaker.com. Hi, I'm Douglas E. Welch from A Gardener's Notebook at DouglasEWelch.com. Whether I'm out working in the garden or dreaming of gardening during the long, cold winter nights, I love to hear what's happening in the garden with Joey and Holly Bear on the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Podcast. Welcome back to the program. If you want to visit our, you want to hear more about our sponsors, you can go to our website at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, and you can go to the podcast tab. Feel free to support our sponsors as they support us. Well, let's go to the TWVG hotline and bring in our next guest. He is just a few hours north of the WI Garden Media Studios. He has his own podcast that you can listen to at lostskillspodcast.com. That will be in the show notes below. And a forum where you can participate and share your information with others from around the world for those of us who have like-minded concepts. Jeff Ranke the, has a simple approach at tackling problems you face in every day uh, on your homestead or even in just your home, regardless if you own land or not. Welcome to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Podcast, Jeff Ranke. Thanks, uh, Holly and Joey. Uh, glad to be here. Well, we're always uh, excited to bring on individuals who are kind of outside the realm of vegetable gardening. I know you garden a little bit, but you're more into the prepping world, and you have your own podcast and your forum, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But as you see the world around us, and, and as a prepper or one who, and I don't want to deem you or label you as one of those people who have a thousand guns in their basement and, and four tons of food, and if the world ends, you'll be fine for another ten years. But as you see the world around us, what are some common uh, common sense tactics or preps or, or, or methods that you feel that people are really lacking in everyday life? Well, first thing I see that people are lacking is the ability to grow their own food, for one. You know, everybody thinks of a prepper as someone that has a lot of guns and a lot of ammo and stuff, but honestly, how many times has a person ever been in a gunfight and how many times a day do you have to eat? I mean, it's one of those things. Uh, it's it's more practical to be able to feed yourself. That's one of the skills that's lacking. Um, another one that I think is lacking is people don't know just how to maintain their equipment. Like, people always have generators and stuff like that, but they don't have the basic mechanical skills. Some of them can't even change the oil on their generators. And what good would that be after a, a disaster or something? You know, it's, it's skills like that that I talk about, not necessarily having, you know, six years worth of food. Right, right. And that you bring that up, it's kind of like people who have a box of matches but are not really sure how to light the match to keep warm type of uh, mindset. Exactly. And, you know, the stuff I talk about is like, uh, you know, just having some basic knowledge. Like if you take your car to the garage, you don't know if the mechanic's ripping you off or not if you don't know anything about your car. And I talk a lot about things like that. It's just being prepared for modern life. Uh, if you're prepared for modern life and you know uh, the ins and outs of everything, if something bad happens, you'll have a much easier time. Right. Yeah. And, and through your podcast, you're not really preaching doomsday. You're preaching kind of like the things our grandparents did 50, 60 years ago, just regular, ordinary, everyday here. You need to be ready for this type of life uh, events. Oh, ex- yeah, exactly. I mean, like, 50 years ago, uh, for someone to be able to change their tire, that was common knowledge. Every every guy knew how to do that. Um, you know, almost every guy changed their own cell. You know, it, it's things like that that people don't know how to do. Some people don't even know how to put oil in a car. Yeah. <laughs> so you have a podcast, and in that podcast you cover some current topic, sometimes you vent, other times it's what you were thinking that day. How long have you been podcasting, and what was the reason I've, for the Lost Skilled podcast? I've, I've been podcasting since uh, about 2010 now. I think it's 2010 I started. And um, 
I used to listen to survival podcast and he started a, a site called Save Our Skills and I thought that's perfect. That's more for what I would like. And then the person took it over from him, kind of let it die and I thought, well, if it ain't out there, I guess I'm going to have to build it myself and that's how I started the Lost Skills podcast. But I, I got sick. They're not seeing any good information on do-it-yourself parts for prepping. Now, pe- people, we talk to gardeners and individuals all the time, and, and people, you know, ultimate dream is to have a plot of land and, and uh, utilize the land for the best of their ability. For, and these can be city people. These can be people who were born in the country, moved to the city, and now want to get back to, to uh, the rural life. What are some resources that are necessary, or where, where can some people go to learn about techniques that they need to really know in order to live in the country? I mean, people think, you know, live in the city, you have an apartment, you have a landlord, something breaks, you call them. In the country, that you, you are everything. And right. people need to learn or at least find resources to where here are some basics knowledge of what you're going to need to know before you even decide to block, buy land. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, like, I, I cover a lot of those topics in my podcast. I even did one, How to Buy, like, Rural Land, I think it was called. But it was quite a while ago. Probably should do a new one. Um, best resources I I use, if I ever can't figure anything out, is YouTube. You would be amazed what's on YouTube nowadays. Everybody makes a video on how to do this or how to do that. You can find it from installing septic systems, putting brakes on your car. And, and everywhere in between, it, it's just the, one of the best resources. I wish it was around 20 years ago. Um, also, another great place would be uh, Hermes.com. They, they have really good uh, information on homesteading and uh, and other topics like that from a, a permaculture per- perspective. Very well. Now, you have a forum on your website. Um, when our listeners head over there, what can they find? Uh, they They can find quite a few topics on uh, different things that are related to survival preparedness and and do-it-yourself skills. Um, The the forum I set up as a place where people could talk about the episodes or they could talk to each other about different things that they wanted to do or different goals that they had. And uh, some people utilize it, some people don't. Uh, uh, I hopefully... A lot of people utilize it and put up pictures of their projects. That was the other reason I put it up for, because the uh, people were sending me pictures of their projects, and I was putting them up on the site. That, yeah, that's what the forum is there for, is for a resource. So I want it someday to be uh, like a, a Ph.D. class in learning how to do whatever you want to do yourself. Now, m- many of our listeners are gardeners, and, and we have a, a variety of people who live in the country, live in the city, grow their own food. You live in the country, you, you hunt. This is not a, a, a mystery. You make this well known on your website and your podcast. For people, and I'll let you uh, get on your soapbox, so to speak, for people who are, let's say, not anti-gun, but we really shouldn't hunt because it hurts the animal type of mindset and what do you say to those individuals without putting them down, but explaining to them the basics? Here's what is happening. Well, the reason, well, not, not just the reason I hunt. The reason I hunt is to feed my family. I'm not a trophy hunter. Um, sure. Would I love to shoot a trophy deer? Yes. Uh, but I would more or less like to provide food for my family and have something to eat in my freezer. And the one thing about, like, deer and other wild game is everybody wants grass-fed beef. Deer are the, the ultimate in grass-fed animals. They, they eat a natural diet, so that you don't have to worry about them eating so many GMOs and stuff. Yes, they eat corn, but they don't, uh, they don't eat corn like they're force-fed, feeding a cow corn all the time. Another thing is just for uh, population control and stuff, it's either I could shoot a deer or the deer may starve to death during the winter or a car collision. There's a lot of different reasons for uh, population control and management. I agree. So as we as we kind of think about winter, which uh, for a lot of us is in the back of our minds um, as, as we go into fall, 
what what should we prep for? Say, you know, we're expecting, I don't know what kind of winter we're expecting, but say we might expect a cold winter or a snowy winter. I know a lot of times people joke that you have to run out and get your bread and milk before a storm comes. Um, <laughs> what's some, what are some good things to prep for um, as we approach winter? You know, just um, for, like, people in Wisconsin like us is, you know, just having a basic car kit. Like, if you go in the ditch, will you be able to stay warm until someone comes to help you out? Um, that's the other reason I started my podcast was because everybody that's in the prepping world lives either in Texas or Florida or, or Tennessee or wherever. They all live in the South and they're all prepared. And up here, it's just like nobody seems to talk about it. But, uh, yeah, you know, for us, a basic car kit. For people in the South, you know, you have to worry about other things like heat exhaustion and, well, not so much in the winter, but, uh, just being prepared for, uh, bad storms and stuff. Uh, that, but here it's winter time. You know, winter winter can kill you. They, you know, the, every year they find people in Wisconsin when there's a cold snap. They find people that died outside. It's, yeah. uh, it's tragic. Really. They could have just uh, prepared a little and been okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, before we uh, let you go. Let's talk a little bit about your garden and your garden. You said you hunt for food to feed your family. Uh, what what type of pro- what kind of produce do you grow and and how do you preserve that uh, for year round use? Um, I I grow you know your basic uh, garden. I grow tomatoes, carrots, peppers. I grow kale. I'm trying to think of whatever everything I grew last. I grew uh, spinach. I grew lettuce. Um, I I grow a lot of, during the summertime. A lot of leafy greens and stuff. Uh, because I changed my diet to kale still. That's more of the things that I eat, uh, in the way of vegetables and stuff. I don't grow a lot of starchy vegetables and stuff. And unfortunately, the starchy vegetables and the root vegetables are the ones that, uh, preserve the longest. Uh, I really do need to can more. I don't can as much as I would like to, but, um, I, even in my garden and when I, or things I don't grow, I go and I supplement them. Like they have the strawberries you pick in the in the springtime. I go out and I pick strawberries, strawberry farm, and we bring them back, make jams and jellies, and, and we freeze them. Um, but yeah, my garden isn't big, and actually, I love your guys' garden so huge. It's just like man, I I really wish I have that kind of garden. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come up with another question here. I want to ask you: You're in the prepping world. We've talked about this. How did your How did your family react? Your wife, your spouse, your your kids, uh, when you said, "Hey, you know, this is what we need to do." Was they very well? Your child had no real uh, uh, <laughs> decision. As was your wife receptive to this, or did she think you were just kind of like one of those people on TV that was uh, really crazy? I think my wife. I'm probably mostly not. Um, you know, there's a, there's a big thing in the prepper community about reluctant spouses. When one person realizes that something bad is going to happen, the other one doesn't want to believe it. And for me, that is uh, no exception. But, you know, um, she just kind of says, well, that's your thing. And, you know, it's kind of like your hobby. So, you know, I don't have a lot of hobbies. I don't uh, go and spend, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars doing rock climbing or anything like that so she just kind of chalks it up to my hobby and you know if nothing ever happens well nothing ever happens a lot of things I do I tell her and some of the things I prepare for I maybe I just leave them out there and don't tell her unless we need them but uh reluctance spouse is a big thing in the prepper community if you ask just about any prepper and there's forums and questions all over it about uh, how to get a reluctance Oh, yeah, she, yeah, she's uh, definitely uh, not a hundred percent on board. But but she's not. She doesn't tell you you can't do it. That's that's the other thing. She allows you to do what right. you feel is needed. Right. Like in my podcast, she accept, she accepts that as it's my hobby and things I like to talk about. And you know, it's it's one of those things. Every every man has uh, something that his wife just kind of goes, "Well, okay." 
I'll just let him do it. It's not hurting anything. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. Yeah, well. Well, Jeff, we greatly appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us on the program. For people who want to go over to your website to hear your podcast, uh, the address, the website again is? It's lostskillspodcast.com. I do a weekly podcast every week, and sometimes I do them bi-weekly, or do every, do every week. So you can always hear lots of good comments. There's, there's well over 200 episodes there for people to listen to. Absolutely. A lot of great information. And uh, we thank you for coming on the program and sharing a little bit of your knowledge about the prepping world with us as well as our listeners. No problem, guys. Anytime. And uh, I'll be looking forward to the Gardening in Two Minutes segment. Absolutely. And uh, those links will be in the show notes below. And we'll be right back after this. Oh, yeah. What you say? You say Nasala Kombucha. It'll put some glide in your stride and some pep in your step. Nasala kombucha. <laughs> yeah. Nasala kombucha makes your body happy. Nasala kombucha makes your body smile. At dollarseed.com, all of our seeds are only a dollar a pack. And we have online resources that teach you all about the rewarding hobby of growing your own plants, flowers, herbs, and vegetables. Imagine the joy you'll feel when your children actually help you harvest your first garden crop. Or the pride of knowing you'll never need a florist again. Visit dollarseed.com and grow a little magic of your own for just a dollar. Dollarseed.com. What could be healthier? Water is our most important resource. The key is to capture the rain that falls on your property. No need for bulky rain barrels that are hard to handle and just don't fit in. Rain Reserve has solved the problem for you. With their multi-size and color cube-like units, a rain barrel that does not look like one. Capturing rain, easy, going unnoticed by passerby and blending into the surrounding. Construction so easy even children can put it together. To get your Rain Reserve, visit rainreserve.com and use coupon code RAIN2016 to save 10% on total purchase. Hello, this is Sean James Cameron from the Horticultural Channel based in London, England, giving you practical gardening advice for the amateur gardener. Check us out at thehortchannel.tv. But right now we're going to join Joey and Holly Baird on the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Podcast. Welcome back to the program. If you'd like to find out more information about those sponsors, all of our sponsors, you can find that information at thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com. On the top of the page, there's a podcast tab that lists all of our sponsors as well as all previous podcasts, guests, and topics that you can listen for free, download, and share with your gardening friends. As well as those links are in the show notes below. Well, we got one more task to accomplish before we get out of here, it is Gardening in Two Minutes. Gardening in Two Minutes is an audio production that Holly and I produce on a weekly basis for a couple of radio programs and a handful of podcasts. If you have a podcast or a radio program that you would like Gardening in Two Minutes on, you can contact us through our website. This Gardening in Two Minutes is all about keeping your plants cool during the hot summer heat. And here is Gardening in Two Minutes. This is Gardening in Two Minutes. The heat of the summer is upon us, and there's some things you can do to continue the success of your garden, even in extreme heat. One is simply watering the plants. You want to water them early in the morning so the plants don't get scorched. If you're above watering, uh, as a sprinkler system, the water can lay on the leaves and be uh, like a magnifying glass and can potentially burn the leaves. Uh, so you want to do that early in the morning, and you don't want to do it late in the evening because the plants will go to bed wet. If you have a drip system, you can do that at any point during the day. When temperatures exceed 90 degrees Fahrenheit, pollen in a lot of plants, tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, can greatly decrease in the success uh, that it's creating. So you're going to have a lack of production during that period of time. Again, keep them water. You could go to the extreme of using a shade cloth to reduce the amount of sun up hitting your plants. You can also use mulch. 
Mulch is great because it helps reduce the heat around the base of your plant, and that's good for them. It helps reduce the heat stress. It will cool your temp- your soil temperature down anywhere from 10 to 15 degrees, kind of based on the time of day and obviously how much mulch you use. It helps secure that cool, moist ground around the base of your plants. You can also grow during the peak summers ex- uh, plants that love the heat, such as eggplants and okra. As long as you keep moisture to them, they will do very well. If you have a plant or something that is having a lot of problems right now, think about that for next year. We may not have the same hot climates, but there always are hot parts of the summer. So think about where you might put that plant next year, or maybe if it's not productive for you, maybe you won't grow it. For more information on dealing with excessive heat in your vegetable garden, our weekly video productions, as well as our free downloadable digital quarterly magazines, you can find all that information at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com. A gardener for all gardeners. For Gardening in Two Minutes, I'm Joy Baird. I'm Holly Baird. So the number of options you have when it comes to the extreme heat and what you can do to lessen the stress on your plants. Well, that pretty much wraps it up for the program. We appreciate Mike coming on the program on his regular basis, as well as Jeff Ranke with his knowledge about prepping and homesteading. Mm-hmm. And we appreciate and thank you for taking time out of your busy day to download our program and or listen online. We hope you enjoyed it and got a little information out of it that may help your garden be more successful, whether this year or next. The, the audio you heard on the program is courtesy of sfx.co.uk and audioneutronics.com, two royalty-free and copyright-free websites we help use we use to help liven up the podcast. Except for Nessala Kombucha and DollarC.com, Provided their own audio. So until next time, I'm Joy Baird. I'm Holly Baird. And we will see you in the garden. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener podcast is a production of the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com for the health conscious organic gardener worldwide and distributed in association with WI Garden Media.